That's when George would have given you the bill and plum right they'd like to hit him with the blue pipe. <laughs> but we'll not go into that. Times have changed. He definitely was a good salesman, put it like that. Uh, I'd just like to thank him for his welcome. Uh, Jill Keel, whenever we, I was born on a, a farm in Warnstown, you didn't get many holidays, and one of the, the highlights of our year, every year, was a trip to Kilmory Arms from we got a, a meal out. So uh, I've, I've been in Kilkeel probably more than any other town in Northern Ireland apart from our hometowns at home. I'd just like to start with a wee reading here. Uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 15. On wh when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that they were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray have thee me excused. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and sh showed his lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thy house commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come, that the house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Amen. Uh, as George was saying, my name's Charlie Weir. I was born in Warnstown uh, a good number of years ago. Uh, I was brought up in a good Christian home. My grandfather was a, a great churchman. I went to the Presbyterian Church in Donatlone. And my mother uh, has been saved as long as I can ever remember. My father wasn't saved, but every Sunday we were sent off to Sunday school, then church, then Sunday school in the afternoon, and then Bible class in the evening. We went to a Friday night good news club. And uh, SU at school, any, anything that was to do with church, we were sent out. And from a very early age, I was uh, I'd done Sunday school exams, anything at all that. Just, I was just a mischievous young fella growing up, but I'd no, uh, even though I'd heard the gospel from an early age, I felt no need for me to give my life to the Lord. Probably the first time I thought about it, I was at, in the Orange Hall in Donatlone, and uh, there's a group, I don't know if you heard them live issue, and there's a gay Colin Elliot plays in the group, and he got up, and uh, he talked about Jesus being nailed to the cross, and he says, you know, this was 2,000 years ago. It, it wasn't nice wee round nails. He says, these were big metal spikes that were driven through his bones. His bones had been smashed as he was nailed to the cross. And it made me think that night, you know, this is, this is pretty amazing that this, this man would go and die for me. But my friends were with me and we talked and chatted and uh, I walked out of the hall that night and I'd done nothing about my salvation. Uh, at the age of 16, uh, I left school when I was, uh, my birthday was in the summertime, so I was able to leave school when I was 15. But the deal with my mother was if I left school I'd go to Greenmount. So I went to Greenmount. And to be honest, I never really learnt much about farming at Greenmount. All I learnt to do was to drink and smoke. And uh, I, used, I used Greenmount as an excuse, but I was away all week as an excuse not to go to church on Sundays, because the work had to be done on the farm. And actually, apart from maybe harvest or, or, or Easter or something, I wouldn't have went to church at all. And I used to think about people that were in the church, and I used to think about them saying to me, oh, you need to be saved. And I used to think about what some of the people in the church were doing. And uh, I thought to myself, well, you know, God's good. Sure, I'm as good as them. I'm, I'm not doing the things they're doing. And, and I was looking at other people and, and judging them, which was... Uh, completely wrong. I, I, I uh, used any excuse I could not to think about the Lord. 
At 21, I started playing rugby in Banbridge, and uh, there's a great social side to rugby. And the partying would increased, and I had no no uh, thought of church, had no thought of God. And Jordy could tell you probably uh, I wouldn't have been a great a great uh, speaker as in at a swirl lot, and I'd have been a wild enough man. Like. And I think George was sort of <laughs> a wee bit surprised when he heard that I got saved, but. At the age of 25, I met my wife Michelle. The first night I met her was in the Belmont Hotel in Barn Bridge, local nightclub. And I told her that night that I was going to marry her. And I never seen her for a year after, so I don't think she was just as sure about the whole thing. But uh, Michelle and me, we started going out and uh, we got engaged and uh, with the wedding all planned. And we actually got married up here in Newcastle. But uh, a year before we got married, 17 years ago, now I married 16 years ago there at the end of the 30th of October, but 17 years ago, my grandfather took out. And this was the first time that God really spoke to me. And my grandfather was at a funeral and he came home and he told me he was going to die. And uh, he was 88. And for many years he had told me he was going to die, so you never listened. And I says, Gronda, you're not going to die, you'll be all right. And he says, no, no, I'm definitely going to die. And Gronda had only three real loves in his life. He, he loved the, the cricket club and he loved his family, but he, he loved the church and he loved the Lord. And he was saved uh, many years before in a, at a mission in Lurgan. And he told me, he says, Charles, don't you be a bit worried about me dying? He says, I'm Papa. He says, I'm 88 years of age. He says, but a great life. And he says, I ain't going home to the Lord. And I never thought, but he was just, uh, you know, a bit of a turn, he'd be all right. But we got the doctor for him, and as the week went on, he uh, still insisted that he was going to die. And uh, my father had to shave him every morning, but he went into the bathroom to shave him this morning. And uh, my granddad let, uh, my dad let a yell out of him, and I went in, and he had the razor up his face once. And I took my grandfather off him and laid him down on the floor, and he had the biggest smile on his face. And I, I'll never forget that smile. And I knew then that, that uh, if I died that day, that I wouldn't have that smile on my face. And the last thing he said, he looked up at my father and he says, John, I'm away, goodbye. And I just thought this was amazing that he could go to his death like that. And I knew that I couldn't, if I was going to die, I, I was afraid, like if, if I was dying. I actually went to see people at that stage and asked them about Jesus, I asked my minister and I asked this, but uh, I was getting married and life took over again and, and I'd never done anything about it. Uh, I went on, Michelle and me, we got married the next year and we, we have four kids. They're pretty good most of the time. Uh, whenever they're cheeky, my dad just tells me that I'm getting my own back. So. I can't argue with them there. However, God hadn't finished with me at this stage. And uh, about six years ago, my cousin Laverne, who I would have went out and partied with, Laverne was like me, she was pretty wild, she liked the nightlife, liked the nightclubs. Laverne, she was a very fit girl and she was, she was doing a 10k run to raise money for, I actually believe it was for cancer at the time. And she'd done the run and she had a bit of a blurriness over her eye and they took her into the hospital and it turned out that she had a tumour. And they gave her uh, three months to live. Now, Laverna got married and I got married and I didn't see her as much, but I don't know why, but it was just, I don't visit people very much. A busy lifestyle with the farm and my wife and my kids. But I just had to go and visit Laverne. And I went and visited her. And, uh, she, they only gave her three months to live, but she, and I didn't know at that stage that that was, I didn't know it was terminal, but I went and visited her, and she lived for 14 months, and she had four lovely girls, so she had. And whenever Laverne had been young, she'd got saved, but well, she'd backslid. But she came back to the Lord, and uh, whenever uh, she was lying, wasting away with the cancer, she had meetings in her house, and give her testimony and things. And it, it touched me. And uh, 
All along in my life, I thought, you know, I'm all right, I'll get saved when I'm seven or eighty. I don't have to worry about it. But here was this girl who's the same age as me, and she was dying with cancer. And I knew then that I had to do something about my salvation, but I, I never done anything. And uh, Laverne was sitting on the sofa the last night I was talking to her, and she just said the same thing as my granddad says. She says, don't be worrying about me, she says. I'm happy. She says, now, I wish I was here to see my girls growing up, but the Lord has promised me he's going to look after them, and I'm going to have them, and I'm happy. Don't you be worrying about me, but she says, you need to get saved. And I give the silly wee nervous laugh, you know, whenever you... You knew the person was right, but you didn't want to say anything. And uh, a few days later, Laverne died. And uh, I was standing beside her coffin with her father, and I said to him, I says, Uncle Cecil, he says, Uncle Cecil has been a Christ, good Christian man. He's built churches, and he's done a lot of work for the Lord. I says to him, why are you not angry? And he says, why would I be angry, he says. He says, Laverne's in heaven. He says, I prayed every day that the Lord was spare, but that wasn't to be. But he says, imagine Charles, if she'd have got hit by a car, and I had to stand here beside her today knowing that she's in a lost eternity. He says she's in heaven, and he says, in two weeks or two years or whatever, I'll be there with her. And this really just amazed me that this man could stand beside his daughter's grave or coffin and say this. I knew then that... Uh, I wanted to get saved, but I couldn't understand how you got this faith. And as I said earlier, I didn't go to church or anything at this stage. And my wife, she uh, came to me and she says, Charles, you know, whenever we got the children christened, we promised the Reverend Hagen that we'd bring them up in church and stuff, and we're going to have to start and go to church. So Laverne died. She's actually, she died on the 11th of November. She's dead uh, five years there this week. And uh, the following September, Michelle and me started going to church after she died. And uh, we decided we'd go to a new church. Or we'd try two or three churches in the area. And we'd, we went to uh, the Presbyterian Church in Wernstown the first week. We just went in and the music was lively. It was welcome. It was just different from anything I'd experienced at church before. And I liked it. And we said we'd, 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 we'd go there and we'd stayed. We've stayed there ever since. But... I said, I couldn't understand how you got this faith. Where did you get faith from? And uh, about two years ago now, at, uh, at the end of October, our minister was preaching one Sunday. And I don't even know what he's preaching about, but he just said this bit in the sermon where he said, you know, you're all sitting down there, and he says, you're waiting on a road to Damascus conversion. And he says, it's not going to happen. He says, Jesus has died for you. He shed his blood for you. And he says, you have to take that step of faith like a child. He says, that simple step of faith and asked him into your heart. And suddenly it clicked for me where you got this faith. Faith was the doing, was asking Jesus into your heart. And that night when I went home in bed, I couldn't sleep, and I asked Jesus into my heart. And uh, there was no flash of light. There was nothing. And as I told you earlier, I had a filthy tongue. And I didn't want to tell anybody because it says, people are not... You know, I'll be letting this. The Lord died for me. He loved me that much, just like he loves everybody in this church, that much that he died for me. And I'm not going to let him down by, by telling people I'm saved. But I was getting a load of straw from, uh, I don't know if you know, Tra Trevor Newell out the road here was bringing my load of straw down. Trevor actually goes in the walk of a thousand men and stuff with neighbours of mine. And uh, Trevor came down the load of straw on the Tuesday and we're talking about church and he's saying, you know, Terrell, the neighbour goes in the walk of a thousand men, such as I do. And I talked on and he says, he says, Charlie, are you saved? And I says, Trevor, I've never told anybody, but on Sunday night I asked Jesus into my heart. And I thought Trevor's going to jump out of the cab. He just thought this was brilliant. And he says, you know, whenever I get saved, I went home and told my mum and dad. But Trevor would have been like me, he'd have been a while enough by... He says, my mum and dad sat and cried. They just, it was just, they says, that's the best news ever. And I just felt that that was God giving me the confirmation, you know, that I was one of his. And I went and seen my mate Terrell the next day and told him, and I says, Terrell, don't be telling anybody for I don't want to, in case I swear or something, I don't want to let the Lord down. He says, it's not that I'm ashamed that I'm a Christian. And Terrell says, look, Charles, you asked Jesus to help you stop the cursing. And I can honestly say, uh, I'm not saying 
at the start, if I carry the kick or something, I might not said what I shouldn't have said. But it left me just like that there when I asked Jesus to help me. My wife was talking about my wife. Uh, Terrell had asked me to go to Bible class before it even got saved. And uh, I was going down to Terrell's the Bible class and asked my wife, or told my wife I was going to the Bible class. I didn't really want to say to her I'd got saved, or my father, the two people I couldn't tell. I got my mum to tell my dad. Not that my dad was a bad person, but I just found it hard to say to him. So he knew the sort of boy he was like. And I thought he'd just have laughed at me, but he didn't. But I didn't know how I was going to say to my wife. And I was going out to the Bible class on Tuesday night, and my wife says to me, she says, Charles, if you're going to the Bible class, you don't need to take a Bible with you. And I'm ashamed to admit it. I had a lot of Bibles at my mum and dad's house. And I says, but Pat, I don't think there's a Bible in our house. She says, well, there, I have two Bibles. She says, of, there's one of them. And she says, of this Joyce Myers Bible. And she says, I read it every day. And uh, she just smiled at me. And I took the two Bibles, and off I went to the Bible class. And I remember looking at the Sky thing and uh, Sky TV, and there's all this Joyce Meyer, Joyce Meyer, Joyce Meyer. And I actually thought Joyce Meyer was a woman that done a cookery program. But I couldn't understand why the cooking wasn't getting any better. But Joyce Meyer was, a, she was an American evangelist. And when we were in church the next Sunday, my wife and me would talk about during the week, but she, she says to me, she says, you know, uh, that she was saved too, and that uh, it was through this woman's ministry in the TV. And I had been scared, but I had heard of people going to missions before, and the man and wife getting saved at both time, and I said, that, that couldn't happen, that's all little nonsense. But God just showed me what he could do. And it was such a, 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 a not a relief, but such a joy to know that my wife and me, no matter what happens now, will never be separated. Oh. That we'll spend eternity together. And three of my kids, my eldest boy hasn't uh, made a commitment yet, but my three youngest kids have all asked Jesus into their hearts. And we'll just pray that they'll, uh, you know, walk, walk the right walk. And, and, and life's hard for young ones now, a lot of peer pressure. And we'll just pray that God will guide them. I was talking earlier about my father, and I think this is a really amazing story. When I got saved, I wanted to save everybody else, and I realized that I'll never save anybody, that only the Lord Jesus Christ can do that. People prayed for me for years. And uh, I, uh, my father, it annoyed me that my father wasn't saved. He's 76 now, and uh, Pearl and the guys in the Bible class and all prayed for him and I would have witnessed him and sometimes we would have got cross and he just says, I don't feel the need. I don't I don't know what you're talking about and I don't feel the need. I go to church and I've been to church all my life and I've done nobody any harm. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't, you know, I'm... But uh, he was, this time a year ago, he was taken into Craig Avon Hospital. He'd been in hospital in September. Excuse me. And they told him they wanted to come back in six weeks, but they never sent him an appointment. But I believe the Lord gave him an appointment. He was taken into hospital, and it was a Friday night. And uh, he complained about stomach pains. And my sister, she lives in Kilkeel here. And uh, he, she phoned down on the Friday afternoon. He's looking, he said to me, I'll maybe go to the hospital. I says, well, I have a few things to do, and then I'll take you. And uh, Joanne phoned, and I says, well, why didn't you get your wee girl to take you? Are you joking? So Joanne said she'd come down time to the hospital. It was a Friday evening, and I said, she's only wasting your driving out of the yard at half four, quarter to five to go to Craig Avon Hospital. And I said, you're only wasting your time. There'll be nobody there. The doctors will all be away home. But about two hours later, they phoned and said that uh, they thought he might have an aneurysm and that he had an irregular heartbeat. And uh, I said, I, Joanne's exaggerating. They couldn't have found that out that quick. And I went actually to bed about half nine or ten o'clock, thinking everything would be all right. About half ten, the phone went, and it was my sister again, and she was crying. She says, your daddy has a, needs his aneurysm. They're going to take him to the royal tonight. He's in a regular heartbeat. But they found a mass in his kidney as well. And uh, 
A yes. Uh, it was a bit of a shock. I went down to the hospital that night, went straight over to the hospital, took him to the hospital, down to the Royal, and the surgeon told me the next morning that he needed the aneurysm operation, that it was ready to burst. And, uh, but that night when I went in Craig Craigab and I told him, my mum had went in to see him first, and I went in and I said, Daddy, look, I'm not saying you're going to die here, but you're really going to have to think about your salvation. And he says, Charles, I've already told your mum I want to see the minister in the morning. And uh, he went in the, down to the rail and the surgeon brought me the next morning and told me the cancer and different things. And I went over to see him and talked to him. And he says, uh, the minister came in and had seen him. And he gave his life to the Lord. And that was just prayer really answered. But on the Tuesday, he got the aneurysm operation. And on the Wednesday, he collapsed. He had to be resuscitated. And on the Thursday, uh, he took uh, an infection. On the Friday morning, they phoned me and said that uh, I'd actually go down to the hospital. They were going to put him into the high dependency. They didn't think that there was a lot more. They, could, they couldn't give him any more drugs or anything to help him. But on the Thursday, uh, and this is the really amazing part of the story, there's a nurse come in to look after him, and her name was Jane Bond. And my grandfather, 25 years before, had been in the rail, and he had an aneurysm operation, the same as my father. And he took ill too, and the, they told us that he wouldn't see through the morning. And I just believe that the Lord sent this girl, Jane Bowen, she came up and visited my granddaughter, she's a lovely Christian girl, to come and nurse my father. 25 years exactly after my grandfather had the operation, she turned up at his bed. She only came on the Thursday and the Friday when he was really ill. She wasn't there any of the rest of the time. And I believe that the Lord sent her to look after him. And whenever he was getting on the Sunday, whenever I went down to the hospital on Friday, he was really ill. On the Sunday, I went down and they said that he could go home. And the surgeon turned around to me and he says, you know, there's somebody looking out for your dad. As you know, the, the, the doctors know they can't talk about Jesus anymore because it's, it's like a bad word, unfortunately. He says, there's somebody looking after your father. But he says, he went into the hospital with a sore stomach. And he says, he had an aneurysm, the regular heartbeat, and the kidney. He got his kidney out in February. He says any of the three of them would have killed him. And he says none of them were the symptoms of a sore stomach. And I just thank the Lord for, for delivering my father, for, for making him well and for saving him. From I got saved, I've got involved with, with the Craig Alvin Evangelist Society with a bus, and Geordie was there last week. Uh, we raised some money for, for, for the bus at a concert. And we go around different areas with the bus on uh, do evangelism, and I think if you ask Charlie, don't anybody who'd love to come up this neck of the woods? They've been in Castle Wall and Newcastle and stuff, and you've maybe seen the bus. Well, I just want to tell you another wee story about me here because Jordy told me to keep this to an hour. Uh, about 12 weeks ago, I went into the field to, to, to mill the cattle, and uh, the bull uh, was attacked by a bull, and uh, the bull threw me away up in the air, and uh, whenever I landed in the ground, I couldn't move. I thought I was paralyzed, actually, at the time. The pain in my back was unreal, and I was actually out cold, and I came round. And when I'd been going to the field to, to see the cattle, I was on my own, but I'd went back and got my dad to come with me. He usually did come on, but he just wasn't on, so I went back and got him. And, uh, the bull, whenever, whenever I come round, the bull was standing out over me. I don't know if any of the farmers are not like, but the bull was standing out over me with his head, and I thought, I was never scared. I wasn't scared. I can't explain the feeling in the field. It was, it was unreal, the feeling. It was pure peace, pure contentment. I wasn't afraid, and I just thought to myself, well, at least this is going to be quick. The bull had lifted me in that, like, a, I'm not a wee light thing. He fired me away up there like a tissue, so he did. But when I landed, I, whenever he hit me, he broke uh, two vertebrae broken of a couple of ribs sheared off the side of my vertebrae there. And uh, I, I uh, didn't know how I was going to get to the field, and I shouted at Daddy to get help, but he came into the field. And I thought he chased the bull away, I didn't know what had happened, but he pulled me up. I don't know how he'd done it, but he got up on my feet and got out of the field. But I was telling people, this was on a Monday, I was telling people in the hospital, on the Thursday about Daddy come in and chase the bull away. And he told me, he says, Charles, 
I walked past you, I was turned around a wee bit. He says, I walked and I kicked the bull in the head. And he says, all I did was hurt my foot, he says. He says, the bull never moved. He says, we, I got you up and he says, we got down to the gate and I never looked back. And he says, whenever we got to the gate, the bull walked off. He says, and I believe God froze the bull to the spot, he says. And all the farmers I have known have always said that they never heard before where the bull would have started to attack and stopped. And uh, it just reminded me of the story of Daniel, where uh, God shut the lad's mouth. And I, I believe that the Lord sent the angel, that he did the same angel he sent to Daniel that day and stopped the bull from finishing me. And I don't know why the Lord spurred me that day. Maybe it was to come here tonight to tell you my story. I don't know. You can see God speaks to us in many ways. He speaks, you know, through death. He spoke to me through my father and my cousin's death. He spoke to my dad through sickness. He spoke to my wife through evangelism. And the story I read earlier there, the story of the banquet, I was like them people. I made all the excuses I could that oh, I didn't need to be saved. Sure, look at the way them people have looked the way it's here. But I can tell you tonight, if you want to get to heaven, you need to ask Jesus into your heart. I done it, and I know it's the best thing I ever done. And I never told Jordy this, but I was telling somebody in the church earlier. I went in there to plumb right for years to Jordy, and I always knew Jordy was a Christian. And he's a great advert for being a Christian, because he's always a smile on his face. Even when he boys like me and telling him what he really was, he always had a smile on his face. And I think that most Christians, you know, we should all have a smile on our face because we've got the greatest gift that was ever given. We've got eternal life, more than anything we ever deserved or ever could hope for. I just want to tell you a wee story here before I finish. And it was about a flood and this man, he climbed up on the roof of his house on the, 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 this boy stopped in the boat and he says, jump in here, I'll save you, come on now. And the man says, no, no, God's going to save me. And uh, the man went on the boat. The helicopter came over five minutes later and dropped the ladder down. He says, jump on. I'll save you. He says, no, no, no. He says, God's going to save me. And about five minutes later, another boat come along. He says, jump in. He says, uh, I'll save you. He says, no, no, no. God's going to save me. And uh, just as that, a big wave come and washed the house and washed the man away and he's drowned. And he went up to heaven. He walked up to Jesus and he says, he says, why did you not save me? He says, I, I called you three times, he says, and you wouldn't come. And that's all I want to say tonight. If Jesus is talking to you here tonight, don't make your excuses like I did. Come, it's the best thing you'll ever do. Thank you. Get this out of here. Thank you very much indeed, Charlie, for that word of testimony tonight. Now let's turn to the Word of God for a, a reading and we'll bring the meeting to a close with a wee message from the Lord. And I want you to turn with me to Second Chronicles tonight, chapter 33. And again, I want to thank Charlie for uh, his word of testimony this evening. And it's lovely to have him. And mind you, it's something I never thought I would see. I never thought I would have. To me, he's Charlie. And to Charlie, I'm Jordy as you already know. All right, Second Chronicles chapter 33, and commence to read at verse 1. Second Chronicles 33 and verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem, but did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord like unto the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. And he reared up altars for Balaam and made groves and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. And he built altars, altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times and used enchantments 
and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he'd set up a carved image in the, uh, the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem which I have chosen, before all the tribes of Israel will I put my name forever. Uh, forever. And neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your fathers, so that they will take heed to, to do all that I have commanded them, according to the whole law and to the statutes and the ordinance by the hand of Moses. And so Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. And wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns, and bound him with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Now after this he built a wall without the city of David on the west side of Gihon in the valley even into the, sorry, to the entering of the fish gate and compassed about Ophel and raised it up a very, high, a very great height and put captains of war in all the fenced cities of Judah. And he took away the strange gods and the idol out of the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of, uh, in the, mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. And he repaired the altar, the altar of the Lord, and sacrificed thereon peace offerings and thank offerings, and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. And we know that the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his own precious truth. In Second Chronicles chapter 33, I could safely say what we have there tonight is one of the greatest conversions in the whole of the Bible. One of the greatest conversions in the whole of the Bible. What we have this evening in Second Chronicles 33 is a living proof tonight concerning the reality of the grace of God. What we have in Second Chronicles 33 tonight is the reality that concerns the mercy of God. What we have this evening in Second Chronicles chapter 33 tonight is the reality of the love of God. You know, friends, this evening here in 2 Chronicles 33, we have a man tonight you never would have thought could have been saved. Here in 2 Chronicles chapter 33 tonight, here's a man tonight who you thought would have been too bad to be saved. Listen, I want you to know something tonight. There's people tonight who believe they are too bad to be saved. There, are, there is nobody tonight too bad to be saved. There's nobody tonight beyond the grace of God. There's nobody tonight beyond the love of God. There's nobody tonight without beyond the reach of the mercy of God. Because tonight it doesn't matter how wicked a man is. It doesn't matter how cruel a man is. It doesn't matter how ungodly a man is. Listen what Paul said concerning God's heart tonight. In 1 Timothy 2 and 4 we read, Who will of all men to be saved? I want you to know this evening, Hitler wasn't beyond the love of God. Hitler wasn't beyond the mercy of God. Hitler wasn't beyond the grace of God. And evil men like him, even those men this evening who committed that terrible at atrocity, listen, they're not beyond the grace of God. They're not beyond the mercy of God. They're not beyond the love of God. Nobody tonight is too bad that they cannot be saved. But listen, there's nobody too, too good tonight that they cannot be lost. There is nobody tonight too good that they cannot be lost. The Lord Jesus says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Doesn't matter how good you are, how religious you are, how upright you are, how good you are, how right you are. 
My friend, Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. No man trade is too good that he cannot be lost. And there's no man tonight too bad that he cannot be saved. For these closing moments, God wants to bring us to one of the greatest conversions of the Bible. I call this the miracle of Manasseh tonight. Because salvation is a miracle. It's not a religion, friend. It's a miracle. The miracle of Manasseh. First of all, our scripture reading brings before us tonight the rebellion of Manasseh. If here tonight, if there ever was a man who sunk so low in the pit of sin, it was this very man. I would say this evening there was not a man in the Old Testament, perhaps, who provoked a holy God than Manasseh. There wasn't a man tonight, perhaps, in the Old Testament who angered the Almighty as much as Manasseh. I want you to first of all see the pedigree of this man because in verse 2 it says, But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord like unto the abomination of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Verse 6 it says, And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times he used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with the familiar spirit and with wizards he wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Listen tonight, if there ever was a man clothed in the rags of hell, if there ever was a man who was clothed in the, ra in the rags of hell, it was Manasseh. That's the pedigree of this man. But then let's think tonight of the privilege of this man because this man tonight was brought up and whose father was one of the godliest kings in Israel. His name was Hezekiah. And you know something? Here was a man this evening who was born under a godly father. A father tonight who loved God. A father tonight who obeyed God. He was a father this evening who served God. He was a father tonight who feared God. And how often children rebel against godly parents. Maybe I'm speaking to someone this evening. Well, it's not me that's speaking. And perhaps there's somebody in this meeting tonight. And you've been brought up under godly parents, perhaps maybe a granny or a granda, set them on your knee many years ago, and they taught you the great truths of God. And tonight you're not saved. Tonight you rebel against their teachings. You rebel against their pleadings. You almost rebel against their very prayers this evening. Many times when you read through the page of Scripture, the godliest of men reared the most ungodliest of sons. Manasseh's rebellion. But you see in this scripture tonight we have not only the rebellion of Manasseh, but we've got the rebuke of Manasseh, the rebuke of Manasseh, because in verse 10 it says, And the Lord spake to Manasseh. Do you know, friends, tonight, no matter how evil a man is, no matter how sinful a man is, no matter how wicked a man is, no matter how cruel a man is, God gives that man a chance. You see, God tonight is not willing that any should perish. God commands all men everywhere tonight. Listen, God speaks to wicked men. He spoke ten times to Pharaoh. He spoke seven times to Judas. He spoke four times to Balaam. Ah, but you know, friends, they were like Manasseh. They wouldn't listen to him. Like Charlie tonight. Many times have, has the Lord spoken to, through to you. But listen, friends, you won't listen to God. You won't heed his word. Why do people witness to you? Why do people talk to you? It's because we're concerned, man. That's why. We're concerned about your soul, love. We're concerned about your soul, sir. And listen to me. You need to be saved. Well, God spoke to him. 
Even this wicked man, the Lord spoke to him. On the Wednesday night before the Loch Gall ambush, on the Wednesday night, a converted Roman Catholic man who knew the Lord Jesus as his Savior went to a flat in Monaghan town to speak to one of the most top IRA gunmen at that time. He went to his flat and this man brought him in. And this man said to him, listen, I'm here to tell you something now. You need the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. You need to repent from the wrong ways. You need to turn away from this campaign. You need to put your guns down because this man told him that if he didn't repent and trust Christ, he was going to hell. Trevor Gillanders, who was here a few Sunday mornings ago, knows the gunman that I was talking about. He knew him. And him and I were talking about this situation. And he says, that man had guts to go to that man and tell him that for I knew him because he was a hero in Monaghan. This Roman Catholic man who was wonderfully and gloriously saved says he said nothing, but he listened. You know, that was God giving that man a chance to me. That was God giving him a chance. You see, God is not willing that any should perish. And on the Friday night, two days later, he was ushered into eternity. It might have been the only time God ever spoke to that man, but God gave him a chance. You know, friend, tonight God could be speaking to you for the first time and at the same time speaking to you for the last time. But look at Manasseh. He would not Listen. There's the rebellion of Manasseh tonight, yes. There's the rebuke to Manasseh, yes. But I want you to look thirdly at the retribution to Manasseh. Look at verse 11. Verse 11, Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Caesarea, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. Do you see when God speaks to you and you don't listen? When God speaks to you and, don't, and you don't listen, God chooses to speak other roads that he, may, he will make you listen. God tonight can break hard men. And God has means and methods tonight to melt the hearts of the hardest of men. You know the way old saying, sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind. You know sometimes God has to be cruel to be kind. As the Lord said to us to before, you know sometimes God has to do terrible things to get us to listen. Do you know why that is? Because God will not allow any sinner to go to hell easily. And you're in this meeting tonight and you're not here for the luck of it, for there's no such thing as luck. Whatever reason you have in your head that you're here, let me put it all right tonight. You're here because the Lord has brought you here and the Lord has to talk to you here. And maybe there's somebody here tonight and the Lord has been speaking to you just the way he spoke to Charlie in years ago, maybe times past, but you didn't listen. Maybe God's going to make you sit up and listen tonight. God speaketh once, yea, twice. Do you know something? When God speaks once, that's mighty. It's a mighty thing when God speaks to you. God speaks once, that's mighty. But God speaks twice, that's mercy. See, when God speaks to you the second time, that's mercy. And we learned in our vanity in the Church of Ireland, there's a wee line and it says this, Today, if ye hear his voice, harden not your hearts. 
And you know, friend, this evening, Manasseh, God spoke to him the first time, but he wouldn't listen. But I'll tell you, God spoke to him the second time in a different way. And I know more men, and the only way God could speak to them was put them on the broad of their back. Is God going to have to put you in the broad of your back, sir? Oh, you've heard this many times. But you know, friends, sometimes God is going to have to turn the hard way tonight. I want you tonight to see the repentance of Manasseh. Because it says in verse 12, and when he was in affliction, do you know what that means when he was in affliction? When he was in pain. It was when he was in pain, what does it say? He besought the Lord as God. Sometimes God has to bring pain to the body to get through to the heart. And sometimes God has to get pain to the body to open the ears. And sometimes God has to strike the body to get through to the soul. And friend, when he was in affliction, when he was in pain, as the man says, when he was in the broad of his back, that's when he sought the Lord. It's when he sought him. And do you know what we read? That he was entreated of the Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In these closing moments, I want to bring you to Calvary now. Because I would feel miserably if I didn't bring you to the cross. And I want this, you to see tonight the arms of the Savior. The arms of the Savior. And I want you to see each arm tonight outstretched on that cross. Both of them are equal. And you say to me, well, George, I wouldn't be like that man, Manasseh. Sure, I'm a church-going person and I'm an upright person and all the rest of it. Yes, that may be true. Do you see this arm here? Under this arm hangs these types of people. Wicked, evil, cruel, murderers, child molesters, all the wicked of sinners there is. That hand tells me Christ died for all of those people. And when you come to this arm, there's another list that hangs under this arm. And under this arm are written churchgoers. Self-righteous, religious, good, and all the different righteousnesses there is. But the two arms outstretched on Calvary's cross says this, Christ died for all, for all must be saved. And friend, whatever arm, whatever arm hangs you tonight, That arm tells you that Christ had to die for you and he had to die for your sin in order for you to be saved. As we have said at the beginning tonight, there's nobody too bad that they cannot be saved, ah, but there's nobody too good they cannot be lost. You can run to church twice on a Sunday all your life and still be in hell. Because the Bible says this evening, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given amongst men, whereby we must be saved. Listen, I want to tell you tonight, you need Christ as your Savior. You need Christ in your heart. He died for you. He shed his blood for you. And if you die without the Lord Jesus, you're going to hell. No matter how good you are, you need the Lord Jesus in your heart. No matter how bad you are, the Lord Jesus will come into your heart because the Lord Jesus died for you. Gypsy Smith was in discussion with Queen Victoria and Queen Victoria said to him, Gypsy, 
It took the same grace of God to save me as it took to save you. And it takes the same grace of God tonight to save a religious person than it does that it takes to save a rebellious person. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. As this man tonight, Manasseh, turned to the Lord, so must you turn to the Lord. And he's in heaven because he trusted the Lord. And you can be in heaven tonight because you trust in the Lord. Charlie, we're going to heaven because he trusted in the Lord. I ain't going to heaven because I'm trusting the Lord. We're not going to heaven because we're good people. We're not going to heaven because we're religious. No, we're going to heaven because we have the Lord Jesus in our hearts. And if you die without the Lord Jesus in your heart, you're going to hell. But if you die with the Lord Jesus in your heart, you're going to heaven. And my dear friend tonight, what is it going to be for you? Let's pray. Listen carefully tonight. You can never be too good and not be lost. And you can never be too bad that you cannot be saved. And the grace of God tonight that saved this man, Manasseh, is the same grace of God that saved me, saved Charlie, and needs to save you. Will you turn to the Lord Jesus tonight? Wouldn't it be terrible for you to be sitting here tonight and for you to be in your coffin tomorrow night? It can happen. Don't miss it tonight. Tonight if the Lord's speaking to you, listen to him. This may be the first time you've ever heard this. It may be the very last. But tonight God's given you a chance. And so Lord, tonight we turn the eternal issues of this meeting to thee. Give deciding grace we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Our closing hymn is 273, please, in the red hymn book. 200.